OK, so I'll start with just a quick reminder of what we were doing last time. So we had this, we had this basic connection um, within the ADS CFT correspondence between some measures of entanglement and geometry proposed by Ryu and Takianagi, where they suggested if I have a state in my CFT and some corresponding asymptotically ADS space time, then if I, want, if I compute the entanglement entropy of some region A, then this is supposed to tell me about the area of this extremal surface in the bulk space-time um, that divides the bulk into two parts, where the one part has boundary A and the other part has boundary A bar. And so today, actually, so, so the idea was uh, now I want to consider conformal field theories. Um, and I'm only going to assume this formula. Actually, actually for everything today, um, we don't need any ADS CFT correspondence or string theory or anything. The idea will be to just assume that for this conformal field theory, that for some family of states, including the vacuum state, that the entanglement of these states can be represented geometrically, that there exists some space-time m uh, such that the entanglement entropies for various regions match with the areas in this space-time. Okay, and I said last time that that's a very special property of, of the states and presumably of the field theories. Um, the, the space of possible entanglement structures is much larger than the space of, uh, of metrics. Okay, <clears throat> so this is... This is a very special assumption about states, but we believe that for, for um, states and holographic theories, this is true. Okay. And what I want to do is then, <clears throat> so for these geometries that represent entanglements of CFT states, um, I want to understand what kind of constraints do these geometries satisfy? What can I learn uh, directly from properties of entanglement? And so just to remind you of how that would work, the idea is, OK, suppose, so here's, here's the space of eight asymptotically ADS metrics. Okay, suppose I, I pick one of these things. Then I can use this prescription to calculate all of the extremal surface areas. So that puts me, um, that, will, uh, that will give me some function of the subsystems. OK. Uh, but then we said last time that, not all of these functions can actually be uh, entanglement entropies. So entanglement entropies satisfy various constraints, um, such as subadditivity, strong subadditivity, et cetera. Um, so there's only, say, this green region, which could correspond to the entanglement entropies in some consistent field theory. and the other regions, it can't possibly. So if I find, if I start with uh, a space-time calculate the extremal surface areas using the Ryu Takianagi formula, and I find that I'm in this region over here, I find that these, these areas uh, violate the constraints that entanglements have to satisfy, uh, then I can conclude that this can't possibly be coming, this can't possibly be describing the entanglement of some field theory. Okay, yes? So that's okay. So that's, so that's a, a a very important question. Um, that's the same as asking when does ADS CFT work. Um, so I, we don't have a complete answer to that. Um, this is this is sort of another interesting direction for for research. Um, how do we characterize states of field theories um, where the entanglement can be captured geometrically? Um, I may, maybe if you ask the question in the discussion this afternoon, I could. 
I could uh, tell you a few ideas, um, but for now, I probably, I'll just say it's an open question. Okay. So, right, so I'm just going to assume that there are such states um, and proceed. Okay. So the strategy is going to be to start with, um, start with a case of just the vacuum state of the CFT. And for a holographic CFT, then this vacuum state should be dual to pure ADS spacetime, and that should satisfy, if we calculate the extremal surface areas in pure ADS spacetime, that should satisfy all of the constraints. Um, and I'm going to start now by considering um, perturbations, so spacetimes close to pure ADS, and ask what are the constraints on those, and then we'll talk about more general spacetimes um, towards the end of the lecture. Okay, so last time uh, I derived the constraint that you have for first order perturbations. Okay, so if I start with a vacuum and then I add some perturbation, there's a constraint that the entanglement entropies has, have to satisfy. And the constraint that we derived is that for some subsystem A, as I make this perturbation, the change in the entanglement entropy for region A has to be equal to the change in this expectation value of what I call the modular Hamiltonian. And that is just the log of the unperturbed density matrix. Okay, so this would be um, in our case, this would be the density, the vacuum density matrix for this region. That's some operator. And then as I make the perturbation, the change in the expectation value of that operator must equal the change in the entanglement entropy. And this followed just by the de definition of entanglement entropy. No, yeah, so the idea is, in this formula, you should interpret the H as being fixed and just the state changing. So, so, um, so the H is the modular Hamiltonian corresponding to the vacuum. Um, so this is, I'll say, unperturbed. Uh, so I'll give you an example. So this is going to be useful um, in the cases where we can actually calculate this modular Hamiltonian. I mean, it's always true, but many times the density matrix or the modular Hamiltonian is some very complicated operator that we don't know. But in the previous lectures, we talked about a case where we can compute it exactly. Okay, so we're going to be considering a, a conformal field theory. Um, our unperturbed state, as I said, is the vacuum state. And we're going to take the region A to be equal to a ball-shaped region. I'll call it B for ball. Okay. okay. And then what I said previously was that we can calculate the density matrix for this special case, because the, this causal diamond or domain of dependence of a ball, you can obtain this region from a Rindler wedge, from a half space, from the domain of dependence of a half space by a conformal transformation. And so you can obtain an expression for the density matrix, the vacuum density matrix for a ball, from the vacuum density matrix for a half space. And that's the thermal density matrix with respect to the Rindler Hamiltonian. So we had this calculation in the previous lecture where we explicitly found what uh, the density matrix for this region is. And so then we explicitly can find what the modular Hamiltonian is, and I can write it down. So the modular Hamiltonian is then just the Hamiltonian that generates this
this flow in this causal diamond that is the image of the Rindler time flow. Okay, so, so, or the image of the boost operation in a Rindler wedge under the conformal transformations. So this thing is a conformal killing vector. So it's a symmetry generator of the conformal field theory. Um, and explicitly, we can write down, okay, so if we use, if we use the standard know their procedure to write down an operator, um, it's then an integral over, over the region. of the zero component of the current associated with this, with this flow, with this symmetry, and this is what it looks like. Um, so remember, the, the, the usual Hamiltonian, if, if we wanted to write down the operator associated with the, just the ordinary time flow in the CFT, it would just be an integral over all of space of T0, 0, which is the zero component of the current. Um, this one is a, a different symmetry generator, and here we have a weighting function. So it's an integral now just over the ball of a weighting function that vanishes at the edge of the ball. So this function here, r, is the radius of the ball, big R is the radius of the ball, <clears throat> and then little r is the radial coordinate inside the ball. Okay, so this is a weighting function, and this defines uh, an operator um, on this region B. So that's useful now because we have a way to explicitly write down this first law. So this equation now becomes delta S equals delta of the energy density integrated with this weighting function over the ball. Okay, so incidentally, this is true for any conformal field theory, and it tells you how the entanglement entropy for states near the vacuum is related to the stress tensor expectation value. So what we want to do is apply this in the case of our holographic theory. Okay, so now we're going to assume that we're talking about a, a CFT state whose entanglements are related to some geometry. Okay, so since we're close to the vacuum state in the CFT, we're thinking about geometries which are going to be close to ADS. So our, our, our space time that computes the entanglement will be ADS2 plus some perturbation. And just to write down an explicit formula, we can use this Pfefferman-Gram form of the metric. So this would be the Pfefferman-Gram metric for pure ADS. And then if I want to consider a perturbed space-time, I can add some perturbation function. So this is a gauge choice for describing metric perturbation, asymptotically ADS metrics. And I've put in this, um, I put in this power of Z here for convenience. If I make this choice, then, um, then this function H will be well behaved as Z goes to zero. Okay, so our, so our question is if, if, I, uh, if I take this metric, and, um, and compute entanglement entropies according to Ryu Takenagi, um, in which cases will I satisfy this? So what does, let me, let me 
this right hand side I'm going to I'm going to refer to as just delta E B. So what does this first law, delta S B equals delta E B tell us about H mu nu? So any questions before I go on? OK, so yes. Sorry, I mean, entanglement entropy has a definition in field theory, and stress tensor has a definition in field theory. So these are, I mean, these are two different things. In principle, I would do different calculations to calculate those. Uh, but maybe the content was that I, I then did a calculation to find out what the modular Hamiltonian is. So I was able to reproduce. So now, now I can write exactly what this side should be. So now I think it, now it has content once I, once I tell you what that modular Hamiltonian is. Well, well, I mean, even, okay, so even in, even in CFT, I guess I would say it's, it's too different. I, I mean, if I, if I told you go and calculate entanglement, and here's a state, go and calculate the entanglement entropy for this region, and now go and calculate uh, the expectation value of the stress tensor. I mean, you go and do two separate calculations, and then you can check. I mean, it was, it was I mean, it, the derivation was somewhat trivial, but, For the vacuum, for the vacuum. But now we're making a statement about states near the vacuum. So it's really, I mean, it's really, even when I, even in, in the general case, remember, this is, this is basically the first law of thermodynamics. So, so it, it, if I start with, more generally, some thermal state, um, so once I say, here's the thermal state for this Hamiltonian, um, then I do my derivation and I, I get the first law of thermodynamics. So that, you know, that has some content. So, um, okay. Now from the, so what we want to do is translate this to a statement about the, the gravity side. And we, we have assumed that the left hand side here corresponds to the area of some surface. But actually we don't know anything about this, the expectation value of the stress tensor um, I'm not assuming, I'm not going to use anything from ADS CFT. So, so far we actually don't know how to translate this to the gravity side. Okay. But the interesting thing is that I can come up with a rule for that by considering the limit of this equation um, when the ball is very small. Yes? Oh, just about this, this form, this Pfefferman Gram gauge. Um, I mean, the physical motivation, one of the physical motivations is that it will turn out, um, it will turn out that, that in this gauge, um, you know, certain relations to the CFT are, are simpler. Um, but it's, again, it's just a gauge choice. So if I chose some other gauge, I'd be able to write different formulas. Okay, so, so I want to um, consider the implications of that formula but I'm going to start with a infinitesimal ball. Okay. Okay, so I'm thinking about the change in entanglement entropy for this very small ball in the CFT. 
And so according to our assumption, the entanglement entropy for that very small ball should be equal to the area of this very small bulk surface, which will tend to be located out near the boundary of the asymptotically eddy S space. Okay. And so if I take my first law, so now I, I take this limit where R goes to zero, And on the right-hand side, then, this is the area of B tilde over 4G, and the limit R goes to 0. And what happens to the, what happens to the term here is that in the limit where this ball is very small, the right-hand side only depends on the expectation value of the stress tensor at one point, because we're taking a limit around this one point. And so the right-hand side, actually, you can, you can calculate it. Um, and the leading behavior in the limit where R goes to 0 is some power of R times the expectation value of the stress tensor at a point. So, so this, yeah. you get some power of R times the expectation value of the stress tensor at a point. And over here, what you get is some combination, some uh, something related to the boundary metric. OK, so you get the area of this infinitesimal the area of this little surface, you can see that's only going to depend on the metric close to the boundary. Okay. And so actually this power that I wrote, had I, chosen, uh, had I chosen a smaller power here, the, there would be some inconsistency because the left side would, would be finite and the right-hand side would have turned out to diverge. If I if, had I chosen a larger power, um, there would also be an inconsistency because the right-hand side would, would vanish. Um, so the, the equality actually implies that the leading um, behavior of this perturbation comes in with this power. Okay, so for, for metrics that describe entanglement of states, um, this is the power, this is the first power where you have a difference from pure ADS. Okay. And then when you actually, assuming that once you actually compute the area of this small surface, then it just depends on this function h in the limit where z goes to 0. Okay, So the function h has a finite limit where z goes to 0. And so actually, you get a, what, what you find is that you derive this relation between the expectation value of the stress tensor in the field theory and the asymptotic metric. Um, so, so far, it's actually just for one component, P0, 0, 0. And the reason is that we worked in a frame. Um, we worked in a particular frame, like the t equals. We, we were assuming that we were living on the t equals 0 slice. When I, when I wrote this formula, here, this is, this is a, a formula for the mod, this modular Hamiltonian um, written as an integral over a slice at t equals 0. Um, so we can say that we worked in this frame associated with um, observers whose time-like vector is just 1, 0, 0, 0, or 1, 0. But this first law is also true if I look at balls in other frames of reference. So if I had a, an observer moving at some velocity and considered their frame of reference um, by Lorentz invariance, that observer should also be able to apply this first law. Okay. And so so this result, really, we should be able to, tr to extend it to a covariant expression 
where a, a more general vector u appears. And if I, if I translate that to the covariant version, what it looks like is this. And okay, so this is, this is the expression I would get in a general frame of reference. And so th this is true for any u. Okay, so this is true for absolutely any time-like vector u. Um, you can show that that's, that's possible if and only if um, If and only if this is true. There's one step I skipped here. So if I remove the u's, I, I still have this part with h mu mu. And then I used the fact that the CFT stress tensor expectation value um, is traceless. That told me that h mu mu must also be zero, and so I just ignored the term. Okay. Um, if you if you are careful and keep all of the coefficients, you get that the constant is this. Okay. And so you can actually derive this is the this is the standard formula in ADS CFT for how the stress tensor in the field theory is related to the, the asymptotic metric. Okay, so we didn't need to use that. We could actually follow from this Ryu Takinagi assumption. This is the place where the choice of metric is particularly convenient. Um, if I had chosen another gauge, then this is a more complicated formula. Yeah, so, so um, H, this, the step I skipped was to say that delta uh, T mu nu, it would be H mu nu minus eta mu nu H alpha alpha. And then if I use the fact that the stress, then I take the trace on this side, I know it's zero, and that implies that um, H alpha alpha equals zero. Yeah, so we actually get, um, from properties of the CFT, we get the H alpha alpha equals zero. Um, if I wanted to, I could also impose now the CFT conservation equation, and that will tell me that d mu of H mu nu is equal to zero. So I learned these things. So that's already a constraint about the asymptotic metric. Okay, so yes? About? Yeah, that's, right, so far this is, a, this is just telling us because we just looked at these little balls, um, it's telling us about something about how the boundary behavior of the metric has to be if I have a state that describes the entanglement of some theory. Okay. So. Okay, so now, so now this is good because what I'm going to do is plug this in to this formula over here. Okay, so now we know how to interpret the stress tensor expectation value on the gravity side. And so now we can actually turn this into a completely gravitational equation. Okay, so this constraint on our first law Now implies that the delta of the area of B tilde over 4G Newton equals 2 pi x some constant and then H um, 0, 0. Okay. Yes. Yes, right, so we're, we're, uh, we're completely um, 
focused on ball-shaped regions. And so when you see B, it's a ball. Yeah, so, so the question was about quantum corrections. Um, and I should say that for now, I'm, I'm working completely in the large end limit with a classical formula. And I will mention what happens if you include quantum corrections uh, later. So, so, so far, it's just using, when I translated from here to here, then it's just using the leading expression. Later, if I want to include the quantum corrections, then when I go from here to here, there'll be an additional term here that involves the bulk entanglement uh, of quantum fields in the bulk. OK. OK, so what, what, is this, uh, what is this kind of constraint? We've translated this first law into a gravitational constraint. Um, and it's all, it's all expressed in terms of this metric perturbation h. Okay? So this side is like an integral over b tilde of some local function of h. And the right-hand side is an integral over b of some local function of h. And so if I draw the, if I draw the picture, um, okay. basically it's saying that if I have a metric which captures the entanglement entropy of some CFT state, and I calculate some integral over here, OK, I could write it explicitly. Um, Schematically, so so it, it looks something like this: some integral over over the surface B tilde. I can calculate that in terms of h, and I could calculate this one in terms of h. And those have to that those have to be equal. And that will be true for some space times m, and it won't be true for other ones. And so far, it's a little bit clear, it's a little bit unclear what that really means. OK, so it's, it's roughly telling us that something about the metric deep in the space time has to be determined by something on the boundary. Oh, so this, this index um, is, yeah, so, yeah, so I'm, in, in this formula, I'm splitting up the coordinates into t, z, and xi. Okay. Um, okay, so an important thing to emphasize is that this is actually not just one constraint. Um, we get one constraint for every possible ball. Okay, so so if, if I have this this metric uh, describing the space time m, this equation has to be true for this ball, but also for this ball, and this ball, and this ball, and and balls in other frames of reference as well. Okay. So roughly speaking, you actually get one constraint. Um, you get one constraint for pretty much every point in, in this dual space. Okay, if you think of maybe the tip of the ball as labeling which point your constraint is associated with. Um, and so that's, that suggests that maybe we actually have enough, maybe there's enough constraints um, that you could translate all of these things into some kind of local equation that must be satisfied in the, in the bulk. OK, and it, so it turns out that this is the case. And morally speaking, 
what we're going to do now is basically the same as going from the integral version of Maxwell's equations to the, the differential version. We're just going to make some application of Stokes' theorem, and then all these non-local kind of integral constraints are going to turn into some kind of local differential equation. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if I have a geometry um, M, yeah, I mean, then, then some point, I mean, there are, no, there are no points related to it by diffeomorphisms, or diffeomorphisms refer to different coordinates I could put. Um, um, so so at, at the technical level, when I wrote, when I made this, um, when I wrote down this metric uh, and I wrote down a function h, then I already sort of fixed the diffeomorphisms. Okay, so that would be, um, yeah. Okay, so, what, so here's how it works. Uh, um, and this is basically the same as how, how you would proceed in, in converting integral equations to differential equations in, in electromagnetism. Um, so the idea is we want to apply Stokes' theorem. And so it turns out we can find a differential form, which I'll call chi. And chi is built out of this metric perturbation. So chi lives in, chi lives in this region sigma between the boundary and our extremal surface. Okay. And this form has the following properties. So if you integrate it over the surface B, it gives this expression. It gives the, the right-hand side of that equality. If you integrate it over the surface B tilde, um, it gives the left-hand side. Okay, so integrating it over, over B tilde gives the area perturbation. And then finally, if you take the exterior derivative, uh, it gives you something which is proportional to a component of Einstein's equation. So d chi equals some positive function, which I won't write down specifically, um, times times this tensor that appears at the, 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 the TT component of the Einstein tensor. Um, and then times the volume form. So it's a d plus one. So this, the exterior derivative is a d plus one form, something that could be integrated over sigma. Okay, and then the, the, uh, it's sort of obvious what to do now. Um, we just rewrite this first law using this form so we get that integral of chi over b equals integral of chi over b tilde. And that's the same as saying that the integral over the boundary of that region sigma of chi vanishes. And that's the same as saying that, so now we use the Stokes theorem. So that's the same as saying that the integral over sigma of this differential form d chi vanishes. Okay. And so that says that the integral over sigma of this positive function
times the component of the Einstein tensor um, times the volume form has to vanish. Okay. And the important thing is that this has to be true for every single region sigma that I could draw. Okay. So this integral must vanish for every, for every region. Um, and now it's not quite trivial to then conclude that the function, the, the integrand has to vanish, because the integrand, this function here actually depends on the region. Um, so it's not, just, it's not the same function that we're integrating over all these regions. Um, but there's a, some trick you can apply some uh, differential operator to, uh, to this equation to make the integrand independent of the region. Okay, so it's a, it's a few lines of, a few lines of math, um, and you can show that the only way for this to be true um, for any b is, would be for the, the uh, tensor here to vanish. So this is, this is the linear, this is delta E means it's the Einstein tensor linearized around ADS. Okay, so, so what we've learned so far is that this particular component of Einstein's equations must be satisfied if the geometry is capturing the entanglement of a state close to the vacuum state. Okay. And then we use, yeah. No, so, so when I used the ball of a small size, the conclusion of that was to say that the expectation value of the stress tensor was equal to the asymptotic behavior of this metric perturbation H. Okay. And then I used that formula in the general first law to obtain this. Okay, so that, what that allowed me to do was to replace the expectation value of T mu nu with this, with this asymptotic metric. Um, I should have said Z, this is z equals zero. Uh, and then I impose this constraint for arbitrary balls. Okay, and that's what we applied uh, Stokes' theorem to. And so the integral of this quantity for over any region sigma, any, any of these uh, hemispherical region sigma has to vanish. And so then we concluded that this Tensor has to, this tensor component has to vanish. Um, okay. And we're going to use the same trick that we used before. So the reason why we're getting the TT component is that we were working in the frame of reference at this T equals zero time slice. Um, but we could have worked in any time slice. So really the covariant version of this thing um, that we would get if we thought about arbitrary time slices would be this. Uh, and that's only possible if, uh, if all of these components would vanish. Yes? This? Okay. So, um, so the idea was to construct a differential form. We, that, so I claim we can find a differential form, um, which is, which is built from H and its derivatives, or actually its first derivative, so it's, um, so it's something that has the property that if I integrate it over B, it gives the expression here. If I integrate this form over B tilde, it gives the expression here. And if I take the derivative of this form, it gives this expression, okay, which includes, which is just some, some positive function of the coordinates times this is the TT component of the linearized Einstein equation. So this is, this is something, um, 
which includes two derivatives on H. So when I write down the linearized Einstein equations, um, you have various terms with two derivatives on H, and the tensor structure uh, is some, some particular tensor structure. Um, and so that's what this is. No, I, okay, so I, can, I just write down a differential form. Um, I didn't write it because it's a little bit complicated, but I could tell you I, off the top of my head, I, I wouldn't know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so not quite. So, so here's the, let, okay, let me schematically say what I, I did. So we have, we, have, we have this equation, okay. And now I, now I write down chi is equal to uh, h. So I, I'm just schematically writing down something. Okay, if you want, I'll, t I'll show you the explicit expression. It, it has a number of terms. Okay, so, so okay, right? I write down this differential form. So he here is a differential form which I'm defining for you. Okay, now I want you to calculate the integral of this form over the surface, and you find this expression. Okay, now take the same form and calculate this, and I guarantee that you'll find this expression. And now take the same form and differentiate it, and then you'll find this expression. Okay, so, so we just check these three properties about an explicit form that I can write down. Um, and, and the only reason I didn't write it down is that it wasn't particularly uh, illuminating. Um, and so once I know all of those things about this form, um, then I can go through these steps to, to conclude that delta equals zero. Yeah. So you can even you can even as an exercise, um, just starting from these three properties, you could even try to find out what this is. Um, um, probably up to some constants or something. Yeah. So uh, yeah, at some point I did this exercise, but um, incident. Yeah, there's so for people that are familiar with this walled formalism. Um, there's a nicer way to, um, to say what this form is. Um, okay, so I'm not even, I'm not going to have time to explain what this is, but if, if you're familiar with walled formalism, then it's precisely this kind of combination of, of, uh, of these quantities that Wald uses to, say, prove various uh, black hole first laws. OK. Um, OK, so I should mention a few things. These are the components, these are most of the components of Einstein's equations, um, but there are some other components that we didn't talk about. These ones turn out to be uh, what would be called constraint equations. So you could show that these ones are satisfied, once, once you have the rest of the components, these equations are satisfied as long as they're satisfied at z equals zero. And you could show that they're satisfied at z equals zero as long as h mu mu equals zero and delta mu h mu nu equals zero. And these are the things that already followed from the tracelessness and conservation of the CFT stress tensor. I'll, I'll just mention also that if you had included the quantum correction. Okay. Uh, and I won't have time to go through this fully, so had I included Okay. 
Had I included this term, okay, which, is, which says that the CFT entanglement entropy is equal to the area um, plus the bulk entanglement entropy across this surface, okay. then it's possible to use a, a bulk version of this entanglement first law to rewrite this term in terms of the expectation value of the stress tensor in the bulk. And then what happens if you, if you follow through the whole derivation, you end up getting precisely the expectation value of the bulk stress tensor as a source term for these linearized equations. Yes? Um, no, yeah, so, so I, well, let me talk about, I'm not, the rest of the lecture is about going beyond linearized equations. So, yeah, so now I want to talk about what can you say, um, what can you say beyond linear order? Okay, and, and you might, so you might wonder, can you get the, Can you get the nonlinear Einstein equations? Okay, so we've shown that we've shown that um, any metric close to pure ADS that captures the entanglement of some state, um, it must satisfy these linearized Einstein equations. Um, so at the classical level, this is just delta e mu nu equals zero. Okay, so so could we show that? for just any space time that captures the entanglement, which is not close to ADS, can we show that that satisfies um, Einstein's equations nonlinearly? Okay, but the problem is that um, as a geometrical constraint on space times, um, so, so Einstein's equations relate the curvature to uh, some, some matter stress tensor, okay? And, and we're, we're kind of starting from some universal property of entanglement and trying to derive constraints on, on space times. Um, but there's not just one. If I just give you a space time and I ask, does this satisfy Einstein's equations, you can't really check it in general because you don't know what sort of matter fields there would be. I mean, there are many, many possible examples of ADS CFT. There might be lots of different matter fields. Um, basically, any equation satisfy any metric satisfies Einstein's equations if you choose the stress energy tensor correctly. Okay. Um, so when we're talking about w w as we're going to do now, if we're talking about constraints that you get at nonlinear order, um, they're not going to be specific equations that tell you is this space-time uh, a solution of some differential equation or not. What they're going to be. Uh, it will be some kind of inequalities. Um, so the idea would be, okay, you have all the, any, so any equation, any metric is a solution of Einstein's equations with some stress energy tensor. But it may be that some stress energy tensors are impossible to obtain using any kind of matter you could cook up in a consistent theory. Okay. So this is the nature of the equations that we're going to get once we go to, to nonlinear order. They're going to be something that will tell us that here's a metric which is impossible to get in any theory, um, and that will be something to do with the fact that you can't possibly obtain the required stress energy tensor using a consistent theory of, uh, of matter coupled to gravity. Okay. So the first question is, I mean, is there a, a constraint on entanglements that generalizes this first law that we wrote down. And that would be our starting point for trying to constrain metrics at higher order. Okay. And it turns out that there is a very natural constraint we can write down. And it's simply that if I have a large perturbation, so a general state not close to the vacuum state, um, then the entanglement entropy 
of this ball relative to the vacuum state, it turns out that it has to be less than or equal to the change in the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian, of the vacuum modular Hamiltonian. Okay. So it's exactly the, exactly the equation we had before, but now it's an inequality and it applies to any states. And this comes from okay. This comes from a quantity thinking about a quantity which is called relative entropy. So it's, it's defined like this. It's a way to compare two density matrices. Okay, so we can, think of, we can think of our state, and then we can think of the vacuum state. And if I look at the ball, then this one has a density matrix rho b, and this one has a density matrix sigma b. And I might want to say, how different are these two density matrices? So I can compute this quantity. And the nice property of this quantity is that it vanishes if and only if the two density matrices are the same. Okay. And otherwise, it's always positive. And actually, furthermore, if I consider a larger region, so I, I think of one region B, and now think of a larger region B2, then this quantity always increases as I go to the larger region. So it's positive and it's monotonic. And I can show that it's actually exactly the difference between these two quantities. So by By using the definitions that we had so far, you can just check that this definition of relative entropy is equal to the change in the expectation value of the modular Hamiltonian, okay, that I'm ca calculating from sigma, minus the change of the entanglement entropy. Okay. So in quantum information theory, this is a, a measure of distinguishability between these two, between these two states. Yeah, so this is a row. So it's, it's not symmetrical. So you, you should think of it as something which compares the state rho to a reference fit state sigma. Okay, if it were sigma, then it would just be the, dip, that would be delta s. That would be the entanglement entropy of this minus the entanglement. But this is, this is a little bit different. Okay. Okay, so uh, five, five minutes or should I? Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so I'll just summarize the results and then if you, maybe in the discussion session this evening, we can. Okay, so, so I can just tell you then the results. So, so it, it's, a, it's a quantity that's always positive, no matter what perturbation I do. Okay, and so that tells me that the first order perturbations, so at first order, perturbing away from ADS, it has to vanish. So if, if, I, have, if I have some function which is positive, then the first order perturbation is zero in any direction, and that's another way to see this entanglement first law. Um, at second order, this is where we get the first non-trivial constraint. Okay, so, it's, so at second order, this defines a quantity which actually is symmetric. Um, it's something like a metric on the space of perturbation. So I start with a density matrix, and I think about perturbations in various directions. And at second order, this is a quadratic form on those perturbations. And the positivity tells me that this must be positive. Okay. And so that would be the first non-trivial thing. If I translate that to the gravity side, that has to be some positive quantity. What is it? So we think about, we think about pure ADS. And now we're thinking about um, 
perturbations at second order. Um, so we talked about how this region B can be associated with a certain wedge of the bulk. Okay? And in ADS, that was very well defined. I was, I was drawing it in the global picture where, where you had this, this Rindler wedge here. Okay. So in the unperturbed space time, there's some killing vector that lives, there's a symmetry, and I can define a killing vector, which I'll call C, that lives inside this wedge. Okay, so there's, there's a, it's, a, it's kind of a natural time-like killing vector, um, and so from the unperturbed ADS point of view, this is, a, this is a natural definition of time that lives inside this Rindler wedge. It's the Rindler time for this wedge. Okay. And so at least at the perturbative level, like if I did quantum field theory on, or, or field theory on the background of pure ADS, then this would be a way to define an energy. Okay, the, the energy associated with that time is some quantity. Um, and at the perturbative level, I, I can even define that um, including gravity, including metric perturbation. So I can write down, um, I can write down some standard integral over, over this region sigma of t mu nu and this, this vector. Um, and this, is, this would just be the energy associated with that particular definition of time. And at the perturbative level, I can include matter contributions and gravitational contributions. This would be quadratic in the metric perturbation. Um, and this turns out to be what this second order relative entry maps to. Okay, so it tells me that this gravitational, this perturbative definition of energy for the region has to be positive. Okay. And this is a quantity called that had previously be been considered canonical energy, and it was known that it had to be positive just for, for pure gravity. If you don't have any matter fields, it was, you could prove that it has to be positive. Um, so the positivity of relative entropy suggests that for any space time, even if it has matter, there has to be this, for every one of these regions, there has to be this positive energy. But then finally, you can, you can, you can say, well, even at non-perturbative order, um, even if you're far from pure ADS, on the field theory side, there's this relative entropy quantity that has to be positive. So this suggests that there's actually an energy that you could define um, for subsystems of your gravitational theory. So this is some arbitrary asymptotically ADS metric. It says that there's some energy, even, if, even though there's no killing vectors in this space time. Okay, this is now just some extremal surface. <laughs> There's an energy I can associate it with this subsystem. And the definition is, I, f I can define some vector x, which again behaves like this vector near the boundary. So it behaves like this vector zeta, this conformal killing vector near the boundary. And I just enforce that x behaves like a killing vector close to the extremal surface. So close to the extremal surface, it behaves like this killing vector behaves close to this extremal surface. So it's kind of like zooming in, and it looks like a bit of uh, flat space time, and then you define the Rindler time vector. Okay, so it's only defined, x is only defined uh, close to the boundary and close to the surface, and in the middle it's just arbitrary. But what you can show is that the energy associated with that definition of time um, it doesn't depend on, on the details of what x does in the middle. Okay, so you can argue that there's actually an energy for these arbitrary space time, for these regions of arbitrary space times um, that's well defined. And then according to this positivity relative entropy, it must actually be positive. So what it suggests is that there's actually a positive a new positive energy theorem that applies not for entire space times, all of the, the standard positive energy theorems for ADS or flat space. It's always a statement about the entire space time. But what this suggests is that for asymptotically ADS space times that are physically consistent, any of these subsystems associated with balls on the boundary can have an energy associated with them, and it must be positive. Okay, so you get a, sort of an infinite number of positive energy theorems um, for any asymptotically ADS space time. Okay, so I'll stop there, and then later today we can ask questions about uh, more details.